Hello everyone, welcome to season two of Dardashe. Uh, we have a friend of the show coming for the second time, uh, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi. Uh, Dardashe is a show where we talk to amazing Palestinians about their lives and the things that they've done. And today, uh, Dr. Hanan is joining us after recently resigning from the executive committee of the PLO and is, is resuming her uh, duties as chairwoman of, of Miftah and, and countless of other initiatives. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hanan. Thank you, Salem. It's good to be with you again. Yeah, it's lovely, it's lovely to have you. I wanted to start with, with the question I think that's on everyone's mind. You, you recently made waves when you resigned from the PLO Executive Committee, which is the highest political body in Palestinian politics. So I wanted to ask you why. We're all curious. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think you of all people shouldn't be surprised because I've been trying to resign for some time. Mm-hmm. It's not something new, but I was waiting for the right time, the right moment and the right way to send the proper message. My resignation is not a loss of confidence in the PLO per se, but it's feeling that the PLO has been sidelined. It has not been making decisions as the highest political body. Institutionally, it has not been empowered or reformed the way it should have been. Quite often, we, we are surprised by the decisions, and the, sometimes we are asked to either justify or explain positions that are not necessarily uh, a subject of consensus or agreement. And in many ways, it was to me important to send a clear message. Number one, that we need to reform, we need to trigger a new era in the PLO, we need to respect our institutions, but we also need to reinvigorate them. And perhaps this should be another provocation and uh, trigger for elections. Uh, As for a meeting of the Central uh, Council and for elections for a new executive committee. So this was another reason. I also felt that, uh, I've always said this, I have to practice what I preach. I always said people have to make room for the younger generation. Generations... (laughs) <laughs> and for uh, younger men and women to take their role in decision-making within the institutional structure. And this is one sure way of reinvigorating and reforming the uh, PLO, because we do need to inject the spirit of the young, the vision of the young. And, and it has become, in many ways, fossilized. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to say we need to move beyond the jargon and the repetitive formulaic presentations to a new language, to a new discourse, to a new agenda that is in many ways fed by the vigor of youth and engagement with the world on the basis of 21st century and and further views rather than uh, on the basis of the aggressive formulaic position, as I said. So all these things together and the fact that uh, I felt perhaps I could be effective without being part of the official system. I have been most of my life part of the official system. I don't see why we should take official position to be able to make a difference. On the contrary, I always feel that you could be a force for change and the formulation of this new discourse from outside. I've tried it both Mm -hmm. ways. And I, I believe civil society is a very important protection for democracy and a source of a new formulation of, of the language and political agendas. And, and uh, in a sense, it provides an open arena for a free exchange of ideas and free and, and innovative. Dr. I wanted to ask you, the majority of Palestinian society, whether in Palestine or around the world, is very young. And to be honest with you, the majority of them probably don't know much about the PLO. Exactly. So the question is, why the PLO? Why is it still important? Is it a body for this age? Uh, And and the second part of that question is, if we need to reform it, how should we reform it? What does it need to look like? Yeah, the PLO certainly is a very critical institution because it is a representative body. It was formed uh, primarily by the Arab countries, but then it declared its independence (laughs) from uh, Arab patronage and uh, very clearly formed an address to represent the Palestinian people, especially after all these attempts at the fragmentation 
uh, of, of the people, whether in exile or later under occupation, or in, in terms of expecting the Palestinian cause and people somehow to disappear, to be disseminated everywhere, to be fragmented, and not to have any kind of political body. The PLO is a representative body. It is political, yes, it is the highest political body, but it represents Palestinians everywhere. And symbolically, it also represents our right to self-determination. And gradually, the PLO gained recognition internationally, even within the UN as the sole legitimate representative, as well as within the Arab world. Now, it had several constituent components, whether representatives of different factions and political parties, because it was liberation, and therefore all the different liberation factions were involved. And... Uh, this representation was within the PNC, Palestine National Council, which is a larger body as a national parliament. And then from them, from the PNC, you elect the executive committee, which is sort of like the cabinet. So that PLO represented Palestinians everywhere, represented the Palestinian identity that was supposed to be totally negated, uh, represented the right to self-determination and freedom, which was the focus of the agenda of the PLO. It was a safeguard for all Palestinians that we do have a legitimate representation and address with different representations of unions, different representations of uh, segments of society, Palestinians everywhere. And we, we sought really to protect it and develop it. And it forged relations with all the revolutionary movements of the world. When I was a member of the German Union of Palestine Students, we had relations with the ANC and South Africa. We had relations with all the liberation movements. So it, its primary task was liberation, and it was seen as a revolutionary representative body. But it had multiple functions in order to maintain this address for the national identity and rights, of repository of rights, if you will. Gradually, after the signing of the DOP and with the, all the problems with the what is called the Oslo process and, and so on, there was clear ascendancy of the PA and a clear, I would say, marginalization and weakening and feeblement of the PLO. Because from the beginning, we felt the, the world, particularly the West, wanted to dissolve, to get rid of the PLO, because that represented a national issue, a political issue, a greater issue, and wanted to confine us to the PA, because the PA is a body, a functional body, that was supposed to build institutions and deliver services and so on, but it didn't have the representative capacity, it didn't have the national identity, it didn't have the recognition internationally. And I think, Deep down, it didn't have the revolutionary and armed struggle background of the PLO. We said that we have to do everything possible to protect and reinvigorate and reform the PLO in order to maintain its capacity as a comprehensive representative system and to respect its institutions and the tasks with which it was entrusted. Mm. Unfortunately, as I said, it became more and more weakened. The PLO used to sign agreements on behalf of the PA. Things were turned upside down. The PA is now signs on behalf of the PLO. Uh, the PLO became part of the, the budget of the PA rather than the all in, in mm. uh, golfing address and so on. So this gradual subsuming of the PLO under the PA weakened it, and the disregard for its role and decision-making uh, also weakened it further. And I felt that we cannot be just all, you know, tokenism, particularly me as a woman, you know, that we are there as a show with no substance as, and with no power. We're at a very critical juncture, uh, Dr. Hanan, because also the, the national project that we've been pursuing for the last 30 years is, is at a moment of reflection. And I think yeah. we're beginning a new paradigm. And I think as a people, we lack the vehicle that can take us there, the one that is representative, one that allows participation and uh, creating a vision for the future that moves us into that paradigm. So now more than ever, we need the PL and mm -hmm. the Palestinian parliament, which is the PNC. I think also we need to think about what kind of body it looks like in, in 2021. 
Um, <laughs> and and so the things I, the two things I wanted to ask you is how do we reform uh, and and how do we reform the PNC specifically to do that? And two, how can the younger generation reclaim a body that's been hollowed out and marginalized? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you have to reclaim it by several means. I mean, first of all, you have to address it in a democratic way. The peaceful transfer of power is very important. And therefore, you do have to have elections as, let's say, the opening, where you need to open the door in order to enter the PLO, so to speak. And the the most appropriate and credible way is by elections. Now, how do you have elections? If you have elections only in the occupied uh, territories in the West Bank, including Jerusalem and Gaza, then the comprehensive representative capacity is diminished. So the decision was that members who are elected here, but as you know, the elections here are part of the agreements of the Oslo process, so let's not kid ourselves. But those people who are elected here become automatically members of the PNC, the elected members. But then you need to have representation of Palestinians outside. And this is where you have to wax creative because not all countries will allow you to have elections. And of course, since the elections uh, are for the PLC, the Legislative Council now, you cannot have everybody elect the PLC because it's part of the transitional phase, which is supposed to have ended. But to get elections for the PNC, you have to address the different Palestinian groupings, expats, exiles, refugees, different Palestinian communities, everywhere in the world. Wherever possible, you have to hold elections, whether in the embassies of the PLO. By the way, all the embassies are supposed to be PLO embassies, Mm -hmm. but they have become really embassies of the uh, foreign ministry Mm -hmm. uh, of the PA, with the president also overseeing the work of the foreign ministry, but the PLO executive had nothing had no powers over its own representative bodies. But anyway, the uh, embassies are supposed to keep track of all the Palestinians, wherever they are. And then nowadays, you know, electronically, you can carry out elections. They can go and register or they can register online and they can be part of the representative body uh, itself, wherever they are. So distances shouldn't be the impediment to the participation of uh, Palestinians everywhere, if you want the PNC to be truly representative. Now, you cannot also eliminate the uh, representation of the unions, like the General Union of uh, Palestinian Students or Women, or the representative professional unions, like the Workers' Union or the Doctors' Union or whatever. All these unions elect their representatives in addition to the representatives of the different parties and factions. Now. We need to reduce the number because it, it became so large in many ways and artificially enlarged. 700, 800 people lost track of how many were in. So the last meeting we decided that it should be around 300. And many of its responsibilities were transferred to the Central Council, which is the intervening body between the PNC and the executive. It is the uh, Central Council. So that's one way of of changing the PNC and respecting the work of its committees and having them standing committees and having them as a source of legislation and oversight over the period. I mean, restore the powers, but reinvigorate and reform and renew the institutional system itself. Mm -hmm. And therefore have it be really the government of all of Palestine and the Palestinians everywhere. And restore the PA to its natural position as an arm, as a functional administrative arm of the PLO. That's how it should be, which it wasn't. And for all the things you say, there needs to be an appetite for uh, moving the locus of power back from the PA to the PLO. I mean, Partly, one example, yes. if, if there was genuine interest to develop a worldwide representation for Palestinians, you would start with PNC in, in elections, not PLC elections. Yeah. Um, that's one. Two, you know, young people are so thirsty for a democratic process. They're, they're really thirsty. Yeah. For it. And I'm, the announcement of elections brought excitement, but also dread. You know, one... one and skepticism. Reason, and skepticism. And as you said, you know, wh- I mean, one, one issue is it's an extension of the Oslo process, regardless of your political background or stripes. 
you have some issue and disagreements with. But the other is, you know, there's about 800,000 to a million people in Palestine that probably can't even run for the elections because of the different laws, whether it's yeah. the $10,000 sign up fee, whether it's the resignation from your job, which is, I think, a unique yeah. thing that I don't think exists in many places around the world. The yeah. age, the average age in Palestine is yeah. 21. But the age I'm is glad you're mentioning these things because they have been addressed, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were several meetings within the society with the leaders of different factions, with leaders of institutions here and uh, with the electoral, with the CEC Elections Commission. So th there has been a sort of public conversation about these mm -hmm. issues that you raised. Yes, people have expressed serious concern about, for example, the change in the judiciary laws. People have expressed concern about the change in the electoral law. And they expressed issues like the, the age, even though we had before presented a program whereby you would reduce the age of running for, for office. I myself, I wanted 21 mm -hmm. uh, as being the age. The law that came out was, what, 28 or? 28. 28. Which is, I mean, that's too much. And, of course, the affirmative action for women as well as youth, guaranteed positions within the list since it is proportional representation. There are many issues that have to be addressed. And the papers were presented to the factions that met in, in Egypt. And they referred all these uh, amendments to the electoral law, to the president, to take the proper steps. Since there is no PLC now, there is no legislative body. So it is ruled by decree. I mean, we... <laughs> laws have been uh, adopted and promulgated through uh, a presidential decree. And the same thing, the change in the electoral law was through a presidential decree. So now the amendments have to go through the president. And if you read the res results of the meeting, the declaration, it did refer these issues, whether it is the age uh, and the participation of women and youth, whether it is the fees, the registration fees yes, to be reduced, and uh, the issue of resigning from your uh, post. This is ridiculous. I mean, this was in the, the old uh, law that people who hold office in the uh, civil service or people who are in, within civil society even, I don't know why, yeah. uh, had to resign beforehand. When I resigned, when I ran for the PLC, and I resigned twice from my civil society jobs or, or posts, I looked around, nobody else had resigned. I think everybody told me I was the only one who did. The same as the only one who, who presented the full disclosure of my financial and, and so on. But anyway, laws are there to be respected, not to be broken. So this law is not acceptable. And within civil society, everybody said that you cannot make people leave. And not only that, it's conditional upon the employer. So yeah. the employer has the right to, to veto the resignation, because you have to present your resignation and the employer's acceptance of your resignation. Why? You should run, you should have the full freedom to run, because you cannot deprive the electoral process of all these abilities and talents and skills and people, young people who are in a job and don't want to lose it should they not win. Sometimes people want to run in order to put their feet on the first rung of the ladder, you know, to, to start the process of engagement uh, politically. So you cannot tell them you cannot engage unless you resign. I mean, to us, the issue is if you run and win, then you resign to avoid conflict of interest. Which is, which is what it's like everywhere else in the world. That's right? how it has to be, yes. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with people who are in the private sector? What do you do with professionals like doctors, lawyers, engineers? What do you do? Why is it that people who have specific jobs only are supposed to... Uh, resign. So this is another thing that I think everybody recognizes. There is a consensus but politically and in terms of civil society that these things should not stay. The question, the question is similar to the PNC and whether it will be reformed and given priority and given the locus of power. I think it depends on the appetite. And at yeah. the moment, the way things are, uh, people are, you know, this excitement, this hunger is starting to dissipate into apathy and frustration. No. And Already? <laughs> Already. And the thing is, Dr. is, you know, uh, political parties, political movements take years to develop. You know, you're, you're asking people who've never voted in their lives and who've never participated in their lives, can't register a political party, 
can open up can't open up a bank account for a political party to, to get <laughs> donations to be ready to run in in elections in a month and a half or two months. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, young people are, are starting to to look very cynically at the moment at the election when it's a time that there needs to be a reinvigoration in the spirit of political participation in the, yes. in, in the systems. No, I'm, I'm not surprised that they are skeptical and there are many obstacles, but of course the young people have the spirit of defiance and change. And I think they also have allies. I think they have people like me who have always mentored them, who have always worked with the young and who's always on the lookout for young people and young women in particular to be able to, to make a difference, to be able to exercise the potential and this ideas and so on within a political system because this is how you reform, this is how you reintegrate, this is how you change. Now I know that there are many obstacles. What we need to do is start diagnosing all the problems and work on them systematically. I've always told you do not just mobilize in cyberspace, organize on the ground, get your people, you have to get the vote out. Now you're finding difficulties or the young people are finding difficulties in uh, organizing a party. So if you can't be a party start, you can uh, start an electoral block, a list for elections. Huh? It doesn't have to be. And then after elections, the young can uh, form a party if they want based on a clear vision. I mean, the important thing is that they present this vision, this new discourse, this approach, and they galvanize people and they incite, I mean, they, they really should inspire mm -hmm. the public to see that there is an alternative, to see that it is not the same old formulaic jargon and cliches that we keep hearing, that there are people with vision, people with integrity, people who have national commitments, that on that basis, yeah, they can introduce a new element into the system. You're not going to be able to remove or to get rid of all the people with experience, because you need to value experience and make use of it. You need to find your allies among those people, and you need to find your own space within the system. Now, the, the political parties, some of them are factions, might try to make room for young people within them. If, why not? Because there are many young people who are affiliated. And they come and tell me they feel also frustrated that they are unable to climb the ladder of leadership to get to a decision-making position. So we have had talks with many, with the leadership of the factions and parties saying, make room, give them the chance to rise, uh, and propose their names to the PLC and, and have them be your representatives. I have women, as, not just as tokenism, as I said, but the, uh, mm -hmm. qualitatively, yes, but also quantitatively as part of your list. Now, as you know, the smaller the faction is, the more competitive it is, the more it marginalizes women and young, the more the traditional leadership wants to hold on. And some of them have two, three, four positions even, <laughs> not just one. So mm -hmm. it's like one way of, of ensuring that nobody else sort of uh, challenges mm -hmm hugging of power. It's important to break this hold. It's important to start. So if there are problems, you have also uh, allies within civil society. You have people who can lobby. You have people who can help raising the funds. For example, if they don't reduce, we asked for the, the fees to be reduced. You can start a, a bank account to, to get. No, no. I mean... It... I mean, legally, it has to be part of a, a legally registered entity, and it can't be a political party because that doesn't exist, and it can't be an NGO because you can never get the authorization for one. So it's very hard to find a mechanism to organize, to fundamentally organize like any other entity that, that wants to be politically active. And that's something that's, I think, under-addressed, you know. Mm. Uh, the law, uh, yes, we should ask for uh, amendments to the law. Yeah. Because the NGOs were protesting about the restrictions on their own funding. So, uh, imagine uh, political startups. This is yes, this is one and startups. This is one way of uh, restricting and, and controlling the, the work of civil society and, and other uh, political parties. So uh, it has to be done. We we should find ways of uh, 
amending the law and enabling them to do that. But every let, let's sort of diagnose every uh, impediment, every obstacle, and see how we can find solutions that are practical and quick. But the important thing is to begin the organization, is to begin people, even if it's just a parliamentary block for elections. There's nothing wrong with that. We did that once. We started the parliamentary block. Unfortunately, we didn't transform it into a party, but it, it can be transformed after elections. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it's very hard to enter and to challenge the arena where you have, where you have such polarization. You have two huge parties or movements within Fatah and Hamas. You have many little uh, factions that most of them cannot get the, uh, through the th threshold, and therefore they want to enter as a coalition. And it seems to me if you have a national coalition of everybody, that means you have negated <laughs> the elections itself and for elections. You have restored <laughs> diversity and, and pluralism. That's another big issue, Doctora. It's um, uh, voting constituencies are no longer by government or, or locality. They're they're on a national level. National, so yes. If you were if you were a political upstart and wanted to challenge uh, for your seat in a in a government, it's much harder now to compete um, and represent yeah. your your own community because you have to have a list that's nationally uh, strong and representative. And again. Uh, the challenges, the barriers to entry for, for younger people or, or women or whatever to organize themselves in a month and a half, get the money, uh, get the names, get the lists, uh, find, find a way to connect um, is, is difficult. And even if reforms were made after the Cairo meeting, which, which were suggested, registration for a list is the 20th of March. So, you know, we're, we're talking about 30, 30 days. Um, yes, yes, I know it doesn't work. Uh, let's, I mean, this has to be talked about outside this discussion to, to find ways of resolving these uh, issues and, and obstacles. But it has to be done at least to start this opening, to, to break the logjam, so to speak, to say that there are different ways of, of addressing this. The, the thing is, if you have, if you have young people, if you have a connection, and I've been telling you this, telling lots of young people everywhere I see them, and women, we have a network of women. We also have a group of young people. Start preparing all the time. Prepare as though there, there is going to be elections. Prepare ahead of time. Prepare in order to make sure that you're ready when elections happen. And it's as if these elections took everybody by surprise. <laughs> they shouldn't. Because if people are really keen about change and about involvement and uh, transformation, then they should begin the process ahead of time. Now it's too late uh, for recriminations, but it's important to, to start at any point to have representatives uh, geographically everywhere you can, so that when you have a national list, people will recognize the names on that list, for example. Mm -hmm. Those who want to enter already a list of a different faction or a party have to understand that if they start competing with the small ones, they will never be accepted within the small ones because they don't have room for their own members. So mm -hmm. it has to be either through the big ones, Fatah or Hamas. This polarization of, of the political system makes it also difficult because within the younger diverse groups who don't have room, and the larger groups also want their own people, the, the movements, I mean, to be there. Not, yeah. not, only, not only that, but when, you know, one of the movements is going to potentially run five or six lists, that's going to also drive up competition, you know. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not also hopeful for their, for their youth uh, membership. But yes. anyways, I want, I want to pivot to our last, our last subject. I think a lot of people, uh, young people, obviously uh, looking towards the future, have, have come, we've come out of this paradigm that, the, of the last 30 years, and they want to think about it. And I think sometimes they don't connect very much with the past and past lessons. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was wondering if you can offer advice for, for the younger generation as, as it starts grappling of how to maneuver and navigate and start to think about the future uh, based mm -hmm. on, on everything we've experienced mm -hmm. over the last... 30 years and more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, this is a cliche, if I say it. You have to know the past, but you don't have to be a uh, captive of the past. Mm -hmm. You really have to build on it. We have a rich past, a rich experience. 
you cannot negate it, you cannot deny it. The vigor, the energy, the sense of defiance, the revolutionary spirit that I witnessed as I was growing up, even within the students' movement, within the women's movement, there was a sense of self-confidence and defiance, the ability to change. We were instruments of change. But I always say I'm, I feel sorry for the young here because they, they don't have this, this space. They don't have their allies the way we did. Mm. Uh, we were part of the student revolution, for example. <laughs> and so we were part of a worldwide movement, the anti-Vietnam War, the um, revolution, the liberation movements everywhere, uh, the anti-apartheid movement. It, they were all part of one system and we were invigorated and, and we felt we could change the world. We had that confidence. Now we need to restore that confidence with new allies for the young because there are allies. The lessons of the past is that when you work together, when you when you have the ability to formulate an agenda that captures the imagination of people that is not caught in the past itself, but that also manages to project a better future for the people with a new language. It's very important with a language that can be understood by the rest of the world, because you cannot form alliances and relationships and networks and solidarity movements if you use a language that alienates the other. So you forge these relationships through a commonality of values, of vision, uh, and through uh, getting a recognition and an and understanding of what the Palestinian cause really is. And then you have to be, uh, to understand that within your collectivity, there is strength, there is power, and to be courageous defending rights. You, you cannot be strong on one issue and then take a, contra a contradictory position on another. If you are for fundamental rights and freedoms, you have to be for them everywhere and in every aspect. And, and that's where it's very difficult because then you have to be constantly on alert. You have to be part of the reform. And you have to challenge. So the, the, this was the strength of the PLO and its different factions. Of course, gradually it changed and there were many things wrong. I'm not saying it was perfect, but studying that experience, the revolutionary movements, the, the Che Guevara as the background of the Palestinian movement is not, not wrong. And the role of the uh, founding fathers, there were no founding mothers, unfortunately. Uh, it's important also to know that and where they come from, but at, and, and why it was essential that the Palestinians have representation and have these institutions and, and, and adopt the, the uh, democratic system and respect diversity and pluralism and tolerance and come up always ahead of the curve with a fresh vision. Nowadays, we are caught in a reactive mode. We sit back and we wait to see what happens here, what happens there, we'll see, we'll decide and so on. There's no proactive uh, agenda that predicts what is happening and that captures the Palestinian body politic, the Palestinian collectivity and thrusts it into the future and into the consciousness and awareness of people everywhere. So isolating <laughs> ourselves is, is not going to work and resorting to cliches of the past, thinking that they had worked before, they had worked in a different context, shape your own context as well within a larger framework. That, there's a lot to be said, but... I, I think that the youth movement is actually within its own organizations as well as part of civil society and the political movements and so on, has its own language now. Mm -hmm. And it's trying, but it's important for them not to be co-opted and absorbed by uh, existing uh, organizations or uh, it's important that they don't adopt the same tired language or agenda. Something new is, is, has to be born. And I have a feeling sometimes when I see and I work with young people that they do have the ability and the vision that something is brewing, but how to organize it, how to pull it together, how to really be a force for change. This is what is needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. The most critical thing to be able to navigate all these different environments uh, and all these different forces 
is a democratic representative Palestinian political system that allows uh, new voices to, to shape the vision of the future and connect with the rest of the world that they themselves understand. Exactly. Uh, and I, I hope, I hope uh, you know, the, the next couple of months will offer opportunities to, to really do that. Um, once yeah. again, thank you so much for your time <laughs> and for your wisdom. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you so much for being on. My pleasure. Thank you, Salem. It's good to be with you. And best you. of luck. <laughs>